So these are our notes on how to take the derivative of an exponential function. So before we talk about the derivative aspect of this, let's make sure that we're clear on what we mean by exponential. So exponentials are of the form f of x equals a to the x, where a is strictly larger than zero. So notice this is written as f of x, telling me that x is my variable. In order to be considered an exponential function, look where your variable is located. It's up here in the exponent. That's why we call them exponential functions. So for example, something like uh, f of x equals 1 fifth to the x. That's an exponential function. Uh, f of x equals 10 to the x. That's an exponential function. The base can't be 0 and it can't be negative. Uh, but these are two examples of exponential form. They are certainly not the only examples. And we want to talk about being able to take the derivative of these. And thus far, really the main rule that we have as far as formulas go is going to be our power rule. The problem is that the power rule only applies to functions in which the variable is in the base. So it applies to things like polynomial functions, some rational functions, some radical functions. So, for example, uh, if you have something like f of x equals negative one-half x to the tenth plus the square root of ten times x to the sixth, I don't know, minus seven x to the two-fifths, okay, we can take the derivative of each one of these terms using the power rule. So we can, you know, for example, say, well, f prime of x equals, you know, ten times negative one-half gives me negative five x to the ninth plus 6 root 10, x to the fifth, uh, 2 fifths times 7 is going to give me 14 fifths, so minus 14 fifths x, and then we take 2 fifths minus 1 for negative 3 fifths. So we can use power rule on each one of those. The problem is when you go to take the derivative of an exponential function, the derivative, the, the power rule doesn't apply. The derivative of this function is absolutely not x 10 to the x minus 1. Power rule does not apply to exponential functions. So the question is, how do we take the derivative of an exponential function? And we're going to kind of walk through this discovery together. We're going to discover how to do it. In the end, we're going to have a, an answer for this, a, a relatively short one. Uh, but for now, we're going to walk through a discovery on how we're going to take a derivative of an exponential function. Let's take a look. So we start with what we know. We know the limit definition of a derivative. This works for all derivatives, no matter what they look like. So we'll start with a general exponential function, f of x equals a to the x. Notice I have not designated a base. It's just a general base of a. And we're going to use limit definition. So generally, that's the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. There is, of course, the other limit definition of a derivative, which is the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. But for this particular exploration, this is the, the, the better of the two to choose. And we're going to use the limit definition specifically for the function f of x equals a to the x. So when we, put, when we find f of x plus h, that's a to the x plus h, f of x is a to the x, and then it's all over h. So this is the general derivative of the exponential function. And if you recall, when we, when we did limit definition of a derivative on you know, polynomials and radical functions and things like that, a lot of times we just were able to algebraically manipulate this so that eventually we just canceled our h, and then we were able to directly substitute 0 in in place of h. Well, if you take a look at that numerator, I am highly suspicious that that is not going to be a possibility uh, for this particular function. So I'm going to have to get a little more creative. I'm going to make use of the fact that this is an exponential function, which means I've got laws of exponents on my side. And we remember that a to the m times a to the n equals a to the m plus n. I'm actually about to use this in the opposite direction. See this a to the x plus h? That's going to be the same thing as a to the x times a to the h. Everything else has stayed the same. We still have a limit, we still have a to the x, and we still have h. So the reason I'm interested in doing that is notice what these two terms in the numerator now have in common. They both contain an a to the x, which we're going to be able to then factor out. And that'll leave us in the numerator with a to the h minus 1. And the reason we're interested in doing this is because notice that according to this limit, 
the thing that is approaching zero is h. So according to this limit, h is the thing that varies. It's the variable, which means that this a to the x is essentially a constant according to the limit. It is not a constant according to the derivative itself, but according to this limit, it acts as a constant. And according to limit laws, anything that acts like a constant can be taken out front of your limit. So I've pulled the a to the x out front, which leaves me with the limit as h approaches 0 of a to the h minus 1 all over h. And the reason that this is significant is if you compare this with the limit definition up in the first line, they're actually very similar to one another with one notable difference. This limit has x equal to 0. You notice if I go back up here and I plug in x equals 0, what I get is a to the h, which is the same thing I have here. I get a to the 0, which is 1, meaning that this is the derivative, not at a general x, but specifically when x equals 0. In other words, it's f prime of 0. So that's what we notice, which means that for f of x equals a to the x, which is the function that we began with, the derivative is that same a to the x function times the derivative of the function evaluated at 0. The correct question is now, great, so what? What does that mean? Well, what this tells us then is if we start with a function a to the x, the derivative contains the function a to the x times the derivative evaluated at 0. But remember, this derivative evaluated at 0 that's a number. You take the derivative and you've plugged in x equals 0. So if we start with an exponential function, the derivative contains the exact same exponential function times a number. What that means is that the rate of change, or the derivative, of any exponential function is proportional to the, to the function itself. Now we don't know what that proportional number is. I mean, it could be twice the original function. It could be one and a half times the original function. We don't know. But the important thing is exponential functions are proportional to their derivatives. No other classification of functions has that property. I mean, if you start with something like you know, f of x equals x cubed, its derivative is going to be 3x squared. There's no x cubed still present in the derivative. Exponential functions are present in their own derivatives. That's actually pretty interesting. They're proportional. So keeping that in mind, what we'd really like to figure out is for which base of the exponential is the rate of change, also known as the derivative, also known as the slope of the tangent line, at x equals 0, which means you're at the point 0, 1, because if you go back to the original function, if you plug in 0 for x, you get 1 out as an output. When is that derivative at 0 going to be equal to 1? What base can we use to make that happen? Because remember, the function that we are working with has a very general base. We haven't said what it is yet. Why are we interested in knowing that? Because if we knew that, what that would tell us is, if we had a function f of x equals a to the x, which means its derivative would contain the a to the x times the derivative at 0, if we can figure out what base causes this derivative at 0 to be equal to 1, that would tell us for what function is the derivative equal to the function that you started with, because this would turn into 1. We're looking for the base that makes the function and its derivative exactly the same. So again, we're going to investigate what that might look like. In the end, we're going to have an answer to this question, but let's walk us ourselves through this and see if we can figure it out. So I'm going to try a base of 2. 2 is a nice small number. Uh, the numbers for this shouldn't get too ugly or too large. So I'm going to look at f of x equals 2 to the x, and I'm going to see if possibly this is the base for which the derivative at 0 equals 1. This is what I'd like to have happen. Let's see what happens. Well, first we need to define the derivative, and I'm going to define it for all x. 
then that would be, here's the 2 to the x, because remember, the derivative of the exponential, 2 to the x, will contain 2 to the x times some number, where this number is the derivative at 0, using limit definition. It's the limit of f of x plus h, there's 0 in for x, minus f of x all over h. And let's take a look at this and see if we can get the limit to be equal to 1. So we're going to let h approach 0. So I'm going to start with point 1. If you put point 1 in for h into this expression, what we get is 0.7177. So I'm going to move closer to 0, 0 0.01 for h, in which case I get 0.6956 for the expression. For 0 0.001, I get 0.6934. And for point 0 0.0001, I get 0 0.6932. So a couple of things. This number overall is close to 1, but notice it's moving in the wrong direction. The closer that h gets to 0, the farther away from 1 this gets. And it honestly looks like this limit, as h goes to 0, it's getting very, very close to about 0.693, which is not 1, but it's kind of close to 1. Uh, notice I did only take a look at this from the right-hand side. If you look at it from the left-hand side, you will see a similar behavior. So we should actually be in a, a, a pretty close ballpark by using a base of 2. So I don't want to, I'm going to try this again. I'm going to use a different base instead of 2. But I don't want to pick something too far away from it, uh, like 100, because I'm actually kind of close to having this limit be equal to 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try 3. If I look at f of x equals 3 to the x, then the derivative should contain the 3 to the x times the f prime of 0, using limit definition. This is the limit as h approaches 0. Here's your f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, with x being equal to 0. And let's take a look at that limit. Again, we're going to let h approach 0. So if we put in 0 0.1, the expression becomes 1.1612. Again, that's close to 1. We're in, we're in a good area. For 0 0.01 for h, the expression becomes 1.1047. For 0 0.001, it's 1.09992. And for h equal to 0 0.0001, we get 1.0987. Okay, so I notice this is going the correct direction. This is getting closer to 1, not farther away from 1 but it would be an incorrect conclusion to say this limit approaches 1. It doesn't. Because notice, I'm already pretty small for h. I'm at point zero 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 one, and I can't get this to move off of 1.09. So the conclusion for this limit is that it's actually approaching about 1.10, give or take. Uh, which again, it's not 1, but it is close to 1. And again, this is also a right-hand limit. If you take a look at the left-hand limit, you'll get a similar behavior. Okay, so let's summarize. If the base of the exponential is 2, meaning we're dealing with trying to look at the approximate derivative of f of x equals 2 to the x, we know the derivative contains 2 to the x, and we think that the constant out front, the f prime of 0, is approximately equal to uh, 0.693147, etc. Okay. If instead the base of the exponential is 3, meaning we're looking at f of x equals 3 to the x, then the derivative at 0 appears to be approximately 1.10. So the derivative becomes about 1.10 times 3 to the x. Now these are approximations. So if I'm looking for the base that makes this derivative at 0 equal to 1, it makes sense that it should so fall somewhere in between 2 and 3, because when the base is 2, I got a number below 1. When the base is 3, I got a number larger than 1. So doesn't it make sense that if I'm looking for the base that gives me exactly 1, it should fall between 2 and 3? What number do we know that shows up really often in math that falls somewhere between 2 and 3? That's going to be e e, which is approximately equal to 2.71, etc., etc. That's the base we're actually looking for. Turns out that for f of x equals e to the x, if you take the derivative of e to the x, 
you get e to the x. It is the function, the only function, that is its own derivative. As a matter of fact, if you Google e, one of the definitions you're going to find for e is called the limit definition of e. e is the number such that this limit right here, and again, this is the limit definition of a derivative. It's e to the x plus h, where x is 0, minus f of x all over h. e is the number defined that when you take this limit, you get 1. That's how we know what e is. If you want to look at it geometrically instead, and when we say geometrically, uh, we mean graphically a lot of times, uh, what we've found is that of all the exponential functions, f of x equals e to the x is the one whose tangent line at x equals 0, which means the point is 0, 1, is exactly 1. I mean, if you think to, you should know what the graphs of the exponential functions look like by now, right? They look like this, or they look like this, or they look like this, depending on what the base of the exponential is going to be. They all have this point in common if they haven't been translated in some way. Well, of all of the exponential functions that go through this point, the one that has a the slope of a tangent line exactly equal to 1 at that point is going to be f of x equals e to the x. So something you want to take special note of, though. So we just spent a lot of time talking about the derivative of this exponential function, and we've come to a, a really nice conclusion that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. But please keep in mind, that's the only exponential function for which we currently know the derivative. We'll learn the others later, but we need to do a little bit more um, foundation laying before we can talk about something like, let's say, f of x equals 2 to the x. I cannot currently ask you to find the derivative of this, okay? Because all you know right now is that it contains a 2 to the x. Because it is an exponential function, uh, its derivative will contain 2 to the x. But the question is, what goes here? Okay, what is that f prime of 0? And we don't know that yet. So for this particular moment in time, we only know the derivative of the exponential function e to the x. So let's start by taking a look at this example. We're going to find the derivative of f of x equals 3 e to the x plus 7 divided by the cube root of x. Okay. So before I actually take the derivative, I'm going to rewrite this second term in a slightly more familiar form so that I can apply the appropriate rule. We have 3 e to the x plus, and then this can be written as 7x to the negative 1 third. And the reason I want to go ahead and rewrite it in that form is that I can apply power rule to the second term. So keep in mind, first term is an exponential, second term is not an exponential, it's actually a radical, but because the variable is in the base, we're going to be able to apply power rule. Uh, so when we take a look at the derivative, for the first term we have 3 e to the x. The constant stays out front, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and then for the derivative of the second term, we use power rule. We take negative one-third times seven, so negative seven-thirds, times x to the negative one-third minus one, which is negative four-thirds. Which, if you wanted to rewrite it, you don't have to, but you can. 3e e to the x minus seven divided by three times the cube root of x raised to the fourth power. So notice the seven stays in the numerator, this three stays in the denominator. And then the negative 4 thirds moves the x to the denominator with an index of 3 and a power of 4. If we look at the next example, find the derivative of k of r equals r to the e plus e to the r. Now I've purposely put this one in here because this is going to, to test a few concepts. One, do you understand function notation? What it means to have k as a function of r? What does that tell me about what letter is a variable on this side of the equation? r is my variable. So that's the first thing that we want to make sure we, we're good with. r is the variable, which means e is a constant. But then we have to know there's a difference between taking the derivative of variable in the base, constant in the exponent, versus constant in the base, variable in the exponent. This first term has a variable in a base. That means we use power rule for the first term. The second one is e to the r. 
That essentially acts like e to the x. That's an exponential. The variable is in the exponent. Okay, so power rule does not apply to that one. So when we go to take the derivative, it's k prime of r, or we can say dk dr, and that will be equal to, here's where my power rule comes in, drop the constant down, there's e, times r to the, we need to subtract 1 from the exponent, so that's going to be e minus 1, now that's weird looking, but that's power rule, plus the derivative of e to the r, where r is a variable, is e to the r. So that's the derivative of that function. Let's take a look at this example. At what point on the curve y equals e to the x is the tangent line parallel to the line y equals 2x? So we're dealing with uh, talking about a tangent line and when is it parallel and that has to do with its slope. So we need to talk about the slope of the tangent line which means we're going to need to take a derivative. So the derivative of this function is y equals e to the x is e to the x. And what this represents is the slope of every tangent line given an x-coordinate. So since this represents the slopes of all tangent lines, we need to figure out which one we're talking about. We want the tangent line parallel to y equals 2x. In other words, we want to find the point, because that's what we're looking for, where the slope of the tangent line has to be the same as the slope of this line. In other words, it has to be 2. We're looking for the point where the slope of the tangent line is 2. Okay, so if you want to know where it's equal to 2, we set it equal to 2. So we want to know when is e to the x equal to 2. So we need to solve for x. Uh, usually there's one of two ways to think of this. You can either think of this as taking the natural log of both sides to get the x out of the exponents, or you can just think of it as uh, changing from exponential form, which is what this is currently in, to logarithmic form. Uh, either way, what you're going to get is that the log base e, uh, also known as the natural log, of 2 has to equal x. So that's my x coordinate. Keep in mind we're looking for the point, so don't stop here. You need an actual point, which means we also need a y value. Be careful on where you plug this in. Do not plug this into the derivative, even though in this case it's going to get you the same thing. We're not looking for y prime, we're looking for y. So I'm looking to plug into y equals e to the x, the original function. Uh, so that's going to be e to the x is the natural log of 2. The e and the natural log cancel each other out, and we just get 2. So the point where this happens, where the tangent line is parallel to y equals 2x, has an x coordinate of the natural log of 2 and a y coordinate of 2. And that is how you want to leave the answer. You do not want a decimal approximation for this. And that's derivatives of exponential functions.